All right, hello everyone and welcome. On behalf of the Environmental Finance Center Network, welcome to our webinar on water quality standards, what you need or ought to know. My name is Kristen Crew from the Syracuse University Environmental Finance Center. Before we begin, we're going to go over a few logistics and then we can get started. During the webinar today, everyone will be kept on mute to ensure audio quality. If you have a question, please type it into the GoToWebinar question dialog box at any time throughout the session. We will be saving your questions for a facilitated Q&A session at the end of the presentation. After the webinar, you will receive a follow-up email that includes a link to the recording and other information that you may need. You're also able to download the slides from today in the handouts tab in your GoToWebinar control panel. This webinar has not been submitted for pre-approval of continuing education credits, but eligible attendees will receive a certificate of attendance for their personal record. To receive a certificate for this session, you must attend for the entire session and register and attend individually using your real name and unique email address. Certificates will be sent via email within 30 days of the webinar date. If you have questions or need assistance, please contact smallsystems at syr.edu. Now for a little bit about us. The Environmental Finance Center Network provides training and technical assistance to small water and wastewater systems in all U.S. states and territories through our Building Technical, Managerial, and Finance Capacity Programs. If your community or utility needs assistance with drinking water or wastewater system management, please feel free to contact us through our request form, which I will be sharing in the chat very shortly. On that note, we can go ahead and get started. I would like to introduce our presenter for today, Mike Tate. Mike is an engineer and a project associate at the Wichita State Environmental Finance Center. Welcome, Mike, and I will hand it over to you. So, Kristen, do we have my screen? Yes, Mike, I can see your screen. Okay. Um, were you going to do the questionnaire or the question? Yeah. We'll go ahead and do the poll questions. Okay. I'll send off the first one right now. Okay. All right, everyone, where are you employed? Go ahead and get your answers in. I'll be closing the poll in three, two, one. All right, looks like 45% are from the state or federal government, 21% are from local government, 16% are from consulting, 15% are from other, and 2% are from the industry. So most people are here from the government. And the next poll, How would you rate your understanding of water quality standards as they relate to the Clean Water Act? Go ahead and get your answers in. I'll be closing the poll in three, two, one. All right, it looks like most people have been exposed but would like to learn more. 35% um, say they routinely use and have a good understanding of the water quality standards. 14% are clueless and would like to have a basic understanding. And then 3% consider themselves an expert. Okay, well, I won't be speaking to the 3%. All right, is my screen displayed then, Kristen? Looks great. 
Okay. All righty. Thanks. Uh, real quick again, my name is Mike Tate. As Chris has said, I'm an engineer. I uh, work uh, part-time with the Wichita State Environmental Finance Center. And just briefly about my background, I had uh, 31 years with the state of Kansas and the Kansas Department of Health and Environment, working mostly in the water area, uh, with permitting standards, uh, drinking water, lots of different areas but all mainly involving water. And after I retired from there, I spent almost six years with EPA, Region 7, before retiring from them. So I, I do have just a fair amount of experience with this stuff. Um, and hopefully I'm starting on the screen here that shows the acronyms that might be used today. This was a good suggestion that came from a previous webinar. Uh, that uh, it's an acronym laden field that we're in. So we tend to use them a lot. So try to put this up on the first screen. And as Kristen mentioned, you can download the handouts uh, right off that tab on your screen. So if you need to have that, have it handy to reference back to the acronyms, feel free. Okay. So here's just a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. It's, you know, first off, what are water quality standards? And uh, just a little preview of it, it's designated uses, which means how you want to use the water body. It's water quality criteria, which is the quote number or the value that you're supposed to meet within that water body. A lot of people, I think, call that the standards uh, quite often. It's really the water quality criteria. And then the third part of the standards is anti-degradation. It's a policy you use to minimize the impact of wastewater dischargers on water. We're then going to talk about the key water quality areas that utilize water quality standards, and those tend to be the monitoring assessment programs that states have, the TMDL programs they run for impaired waters, and then for what a lot of operators experience are NPDES permits. And lastly, I'll try to give you some uh, real world examples on why you should care about water quality standards. It can be a bit of a dry topic. Uh, it's, it's a lot to process as I have at the end. EPA sometimes offers a five day course on it. I used to work with the woman at EPA Region 7 uh, who worked with the standards and she said, boy, people aren't any good with this stuff until they've been here three years. So you're going to try to learn here in about the next 45, 50 minutes uh, what some people uh, learn in three years. So I'll get going with it for right now. So that first question, what are the water quality standards? Well, in general terms, the standards are, are a statement of how clean a water needs to be to support desired uses. Okay, so it comes right out of the Clean Water Act. The goals of the Clean Water Act right up front are, you know, wherever attainable, an interim goal of water quality, which provides for protection and propagation of fish and wildlife, and provides for recreation in and on the water. Okay, a lot of people, you know, you'll hear that referred to shorthand as fishable and swimmable water. Those are really two uses uh, of water. Uh, we'll get into what some of the other uses are that states look at. Probably a lot of them I've never even heard of before myself. But again, that's uh, different from state to state. And the reason that is, is because of the Clean Water Act in this section 303 of the Clean Water Act, it gave the authority to develop water quality standards to the states. And it said the states will develop those standards, but it also gives EPA the authority to approve those standards for the state. So when you've got all the states, territories, some of the tribes developing standards, you can pretty well rest assured that no two are going to be exactly the same. They're going to be a little bit different from state to state. But a lot of the core parameters that you'll find in the standards are, are very similar state to state. The thing they do all have to have in common is they have to have all of the elements of what comprises a standard. So uh, you'll then find uh, later uh, in 
in the regulations, you can find everything you want to know about standards in section 131 of part 40 of the Code of Federal Regulations. And it's really a pretty short regulation. You can probably read it pretty quickly. It's just those few pages have thousands of pages of guidance and uh, other documents that are associated with that. So the standards you'll often hear people refer to as this three-legged stool. You know, the way you make the water quality standards balance out is by having those designated uses criteria in an anti-degradation policy. And so if you're really curious of looking at where those are at the regulations, you have designated uses at 40 CFR 131.10, water quality criteria are described in 131.11, and anti-degradation policies in 131.12. And then that rule also says states can optionally they don't have to, but they can optionally have other policies in their water quality standards. And you'll often see things like mixing zones. If a state wants to say, well, you don't get the full river, the full stream to mix your waste in, you only get a portion of it that's a mixing zone. Uh, they may discuss the flows that are used in those policies. They can discuss variances, and that's something we're really not going to get into. That would be a topic whole session on its own, and then there could be other policies that a state would have. But the general flow of how standards work is that states set designated uses, and these are these, how do I want my water to be used? How do I want each water body to be used in my state? Okay, and once I identify that, I say, well, okay, well, what kind of water quality criteria do I have to generate to protect that use? You know, for instance, uh, dissolved oxygen. Most people would say that a warm water fish would need five milligrams per liter of dissolved oxygen to survive. So if you have warm water fisheries designated uses, one of the criteria that you're going to have to protect that use is dissolved oxygen. And then after that part of it's done, you know, the state should develop an anti-degradation policy to protect uh, their high quality waters. And I'll get, I'll spend quite a bit of time with any degradation. I think it is the least understood part of the standards, which I'll get to when we, we get to that part. And I'll try to explain to you why that is. And it probably should be understood better and have a lot more impact than what I think it does. So, this first part, you know, that first leg of that uh, water quality standard stool is the designated uses. Okay? And designated uses, again, they describe how a state wants to use their water. And at a minimum, those apply to waters of the U.S. If you follow, you know, what's been going on over the last dozen years or more, there's been a lot of back and forth over what is a water of the U.S. Recent Supreme Court case ruled on that, particularly applying to wetlands. I won't get into that, but I will just say they apply to all the waters of the U.S. And in some cases, if things aren't even a water of the U.S., some states will divide waters of the state. And in their water quality standards, they should tell you if those standards also apply to waters of the state that may not be waters of the U.S. So designated uses, the two we often see because of that goal of the Clean Water Act is aquatic life support. How do we support the aquatic life in the water? Um, recreation, and you saw the Clean Water Act goal is recreation in and on the water. You sometimes hear that referred to as contact or non-contact recreation. Think of that as swimming or as the in the water and contact and perhaps fishing from a boat, boating, that type of thing is being non-contact recreation on the water. Uh, it, states then come up with their own designated uses. You'll often see public water supply as a designated use. I want to use that water body uh, to perhaps drop a pipe in and pull my source water for my drinking water supply out. You can have agricultural crop use. There's some things that uh, humans in a public water supply can tolerate just fine that uh, crops might not. So you may have to 
have a criteria, some criterion for various things that would affect agricultural crops, livestock watering, the same thing. There's things that uh, don't affect you and I much at all that really could affect livestock. So you might want to have that as a use if you're a large livestock producing state. There's industrial water uses that some people might have. And like I said, it's up to the states to do it. So there's a lot of uh, other uses that could be out there depending on your state and what they've adopted. But what I will say is that not every water will have every designated use. You know, they're, they're specific to individual water bodies. You may have one that only has aquatic life support, recreation, kind of the two minimums, and none of these other things will apply to it. So you know, Look, generally, you'll find the states have a listing of uh, water segments, uh, you know, by stream or, or lake, what have you. And you'll have to look at that particular uh, water body and look and see what uses have been designated for it. So, uh, and not everybody, not every water body will currently meet its designated use, where you get these impaired waters and TMDLs we'll talk about, but they could with some intervention. That intervention may be better treatment from the wastewater treatment plant. It could be non-point source control, what have you. So just because a water body doesn't meet the designated use doesn't mean it can't still have the designated use. And then one of the really uh, interesting parts of the rule is it says that if a designated use was met on November 28th of 1975, it's an existing use and it cannot be removed. Well, we're almost 50 years out from that now, so it's kind of hard at this point in time to go back and, and figure out what may have been met in 1975, but some states have some pretty good uh, older data where they, they did that, they looked at it, set their uses in terms of what they believe were existing uses. Okay, so that's our designated use part. That's pretty straightforward. Water quality criteria is quite a bit more complicated, in my opinion, and you'll find that in, in the Code of Federal Regulations, Title 40, 131.11. So, what happens there is that states adopt criteria to predict designated uses, and they're both numeric and narrative uh, criteria that get developed by most states. And the numeric criteria are based really on a couple of things. Uh, EPA, 30, what's called 304A guidance, and 304A refers to Section 304A of the Clean Water Act, said EPA, you know, back when the act was published, they would, they would publish within one year of 1972 and time to time thereafter criteria for water quality that are really the latest scientific knowledge. So you'll see EPA will have, and probably have uh, water quality criteria in development right now. Go back and look at old criteria. I think in my time, you know, in this field in the last 30 some years, there have probably been four iterations of ammonia criteria as to affect municipalities and their discharges of our bill. Uh, those 304A guidance documents can then be, can be modified based on local conditions. And one of the reasons you see from that uh, fairly often is that the criteria are developed by exposing a number of species, and you tend to pick the most sensitive species to develop criteria. Well, it may so happen you don't have those most sensitive species in your water body, so there's a method to recalculate. Uh, then you can have just a general other scientifically defensible methods, and that sometimes is a point of contention between the state and EPA. The state may feel they have a very scientifically defensible method for coming up with a criterion, but remember that EPA has the approval authority, and if they disagree, then it's not going to get approved. The other thing to remember uh, then, particularly on this aquatic life criteria, which generally dominates a lot of permitting actions that people are supposed to out there, 
will have acute and chronic criteria. So within those criteria, same pollutant, you may have two different values. And just for a refresher, an acute is a short-term impact, hourly, daily, something that can be lethal, and by that means it can kill uh, sensitive organisms. Chronic is a longer-term impact, and that tends to be a weekly or monthly impact. And it has what are called sublethal effects that we call reproductive, say that uh, organisms won't produce as many offspring as they would if they weren't impacted, or the offspring may be stunted. Now, within those water quality criteria, then, uh, they need to have what are called magnitude, duration, and frequency components. And you can think of that as how much of a pollutant makes effect, how long can an organism be exposed to it, and how often can it be exposed to it. And I'll just give you an example here of these top two of ammonia. You've got the chronic and the acute criteria here. And so it says over, you know, you can have 1.9 milligrams per liter over a 30-day average. So magnitude, duration, and then how often can that happen? once every three years. The acute, which remember is a short-term duration, and in this case, a one hour duration, the way the criteria are set up, it's gonna be a lot higher. Because that short-term exposure, you know, for lethality actually killing the organisms can be quite a bit higher. And it's magnitude 17 milligrams per liter with a duration of one hour and a frequency of once every Years. Then you have what are called narrative criteria. And you develop narrative criteria where, where numeric criteria can't be established, or you want to supplement the numeric criteria. Narrative criteria often describe the desired goals of the water, and people refer to them sometimes as the free froms, free from oil and grease, color, solids buildup, excessive algae, and and lots of other whatever essentially a city wants to come up with. So those are the first two legs of the stool. The last two legs are, you know, the one I told you that I think is the least understood, and it's anti-degradation. And anti-degradation is what's called a framework for maintaining and protecting water quality that's been achieved. So if you meet the criteria you've established for your designated use, let's try to keep it there. Okay, let's not let it get worse. And if it's even better than it needs to be to be it, let's try to keep it better than it needs to be, if at all possible. That's kind of what anti degradation is saying. And it's a policy that generally only applies to new or expanded wastewater dischargers. So if you're getting a permit renewed, you generally don't see that. And it's just if you're expanding your discharge or if you're a new discharger, you'll often fall into the anti-degradation policy of the state. And it involves public involvement. So know that just like your permits put out on public notice, if a state makes a determination on anti-degradation and allows you to additionally degrade some high quality waters, they have to put that out for public comment and involvement also. So, um, as I said, I think it's most misunderstood, and I think a lot of that is because it is a water quality standard, but implementation usually gets associated with NPDES permits. And so do the permitting people have the same understanding of anti-degradation as, say, the water quality standards people. And sometimes there's a break uh, between those two groups and their different understandings of how that applies. But EPA made some good updates to the anti-degradation rule in late 2015 and added a couple of really key elements. One of those is an alternatives analysis, which says that if you're one of these newer expanded dischargers and you um, have a, a proposed a discharge and you have what's called the base case condition where uh, you can just pollute up to the maximum. You should look, you know, if you're in one of these high quality waters at alternatives, and if you can essentially afford to do the alternative, you should do it to keep the water at a higher quality level. 
it also required that states develop implementation procedures that uh, involve uh, the public. And by default, that this any degradation of the federal regulations defines three tiers of waters. So I like pictures. And so these three tiers of water, I call it tier three, is outstanding national resource waters, or ONRWs, and those can be national parks, wildlife refuges, waters of exceptional recreation or ecological significance. And so there's some range here. And then you have these tier two or high quality waters, okay? And those uh, are waters that are better than the water quality criteria. If we think of the water quality criteria here, these waters are better than these tier one waters. You know, what I find kind of interesting about this is most of the time the information you see, they want to treat tier one like it's a single point, like just meet the water quality criteria. And I think probably it should be looked at more of a range, like maybe 10% either side of that, something uh, to think of that more as a range because it, you know water bodies are going to flow at different levels, they're going to be exposed to different things, different times of year. And it's just it's really hard to say, boy, I just came right up to that standard and that's it. And so I'm in tier one. So it's a little hard to describe right now. So what I want you to see over here is that, you know, well, okay, well, that sounds logical. Tier one, tier two, you'd be increasing water quality. So you want to decrease the level of pollution. That makes sense. And so you think, boy, these tier three waters must have really super high water quality. That's not always the case. In fact, in Kansas, some of the only ones we have really fall into this kind of ecological significance. The one I'd give you an example of to make a point is what's called the Quivira salt marsh. So salty water, awful. You'd never want it for drinking. You really wouldn't want to recreate in it. Not a very good quality water, but it's a great uh, ecological significance because it's a place where migrating birds from Canada going south migrate to every year and they're very unique so it's something you would want to protect and so what happens if you want to protect that well you say i'm not going to allow any degradation to happen in a tier three water so i'm not going to essentially allow any discharge because if anybody can discharge something that has absolutely no impact they'd be surprised so in these high quality waters this is where you do this analysis of Alternatives I talked about, you identify less degrading alternatives, you select one if it's practical. And that term practical kind of embraces the thought of cost effectiveness. So you have to justify why you would want to discharge it there. Well, what happens in practicality is that states begin to catch on that, you know, if I make a water a tier three water, I better hope I don't want anything to ever discharge into there because I say it can't allow any degradation. And that's a pretty tough uh, standard to put on people is to you know basically say no discharge. So you want to be you know careful that would happen. And so what a lot of states have done with EPA approval although it's not in the regulation, it's created what's called a tier two and a half water. And a tier two and a half water essentially could be degraded, but it's got a much higher bar that the discharger has to be as opposed to a tier two water before they would be allowed to uh, degrade that water body. So that's kind of the practical assessment. There are some states who made tier three waters they wish they hadn't. Uh, and a lot of them caught on pretty quick. I don't think you'll find many tier three waters out there. You can look at state standards, and I've seen a number of states who have none, zero tier three waters. Uh, whereas, like I say, in Kansas, we did try to identify those that were really, of, you know, exceptional significance, and that we really would never want anybody to discharge into. 
And again, a practical example, I give you that is in Kansas, there's a lot of, most lands held privately. And so there's very little access to a lot of water bodies, but you have a few big rivers in the state like the Kansas River that do allow recreation. And so at one point, a group of canoeists and kayakers wanted Kansas to make the uh, Kansas River and a ONRW, a tier three, because they said, well, that's exceptional recreational significance. There aren't many more like in the state. And that seems to make sense until you think that Kansas is a state with a little less than 3 million population and a million of them live along the Kansas River. And so there's always going to be some kind of growth. There's probably all going to always going to be some kind of new discharge, et cetera. So it would be really difficult to say, oh, we're going to make that tier three and never allow any degradation again. And so it happens to be one of these tier two and a half waters in Kansas, which does allow some degradation, but makes it a very high bar to achieve that. And as EPA has said in their guidance documents that any degradation is not supposed to be a no growth rule, although I would argue that tier three waters are pretty much no growth. Um, it's just designed to let the public have a say. If a state wants to uh, allow an area to develop and there's important uh, reasons socially or economically for allowing that and allowing a lowering of water quality, that can be done, but you have to go to the public and you have to public notice it, you have to tell them if they uh, want to challenge that, it can be challenged and it, and it may not be allowed. So. That's really what any degradation is about. I'd say in layman's terms, if the current water quality is better uh, than the water quality criterion required for the highest use, you try to protect it. You just don't pollute right up the criterion. So most of the focus, most of the action in, in uh, any degradation is in these tier two waters that are defined as high water quality, high water quality. And so you might ask, well, what is a tier two water body? And unfortunately, the answer is that eh, depends. Uh, you can't find it written down too often. And I'm EPA said, you know, look at a water body by water body or pollutant by pollutant approach. Water body by water body is great if you can do it. And you've identified, you can say this river, or this stream is tier two or tier one, et cetera. Well, I, I'm aware of about two states who have that water body by water body. Approach, they were they were smart and they looked at it back you know in the early days of the Clean Water Act back in the 70s and remember that existing use trigger in there of 1975 and so they looked at a group of parameters in a water body and if they met it and exceeded it or it, it exceeded it in terms of high quality they were made tier two water bodies if they didn't they were tier one but what most states do and what's common now is to see this pollutant by pollutant approach. And pollutant by pollutant means that a water body could have multiple tiers based on the ambient pollutant concentrations. What? How can a water body be both tier one and tier two? Well, the example I give you here is say, if you have zinc in a water body that just kind of meets the current water quality criterion, that water body may be tier one for zinc. But if it is, uh, much better in terms of water quality for ammonia, and the ammonia is lower than the current water quality criteria, and it could be tier two for ammonia. So what gets really important in these anti-degradation analysis is identifying these pollutants of concern. When I identify the ones that may be degrading of the water body, and those are the ones you look to see if they're tier two, if you know there's an alternate treatment that can improve water quality. So the process that's involved is you determine if there's a newer expanded discharge then, and if that newer expanded dis discharge is necessary to accommodate important social or economic development. And if you can first make that showing, then you can proceed on to this analysis of determining what the pollutants of concern are. And if there are pollutants of concern that are in a tier two water body, you look for lesser degrading alternatives. So you first got to identify kind of the base case of treatment. And that's typically what states do is they permit right up to you know, do the calculations that would 
for, for excuse me, well, right up to the water quality criterion, and that's the base case. If you meet the water quality criterion, but GP just added. And so you determine whether there's lesser degrading alternatives that are practical. Impracticable is defined as technologically possible, able to put into practice, and economically viable. So let's break those down. Technologically possible, is there a treatment process that could better treat the wastewater? Is it able to be put into practice? And I always think of that in terms of, yeah, there may be some bench scale thing that's technologically possible that's never been put into practice full scale. So that would not fall into this practicability. And then the last part of that is economically viable. And that gets a lot into what I said before was kind of the cost effective analysis of additional treatment. And so what happens if it's practicable, you choose a lesser degrading alternative. You may have two or three, four, however many you look at, and you choose one of those lesser degrading alternatives. If you find there are no practical alternatives, then the state can allow degradation to occur as long as the water quality criteria is met. You can't ever just say, oh, well, okay, well, we'll just go above the water quality criteria. Yeah. And there were sounded like a lot of state regulators on the call, and I'm going to bet most of them have experienced at some point in their careers uh, somebody going, "Oh, can't you just give me a, a number, you know, that'll still exceed that, but be okay? Can't you give me the authority for that?" And the answer to that's all. So the outcome of that anti-degradation analysis and what you look at for those pollutants of concern concern will ultimately set the permit limits for that uh, particular parameter. And as I've said multiple times, like the permit and any degradation analysis is subject to public review. And so my wife gets me this desk calendar every year that I love. It's a cartoon called Rooms. And I saw this one about you know, Bobby, you know, wait till you're married and have kids and go to college and you'll think I'm your worst nightmare. Well, I look at it like, Trust me, Bobby, once you deal with any degradation, you'll wish I was your worst nightmare. It's a, it's a real jungle to work through. And in fact, I do some work as a consultant now and I'm working with one that's pretty tangled up at the time being, but we're working our way through it. So uh, that's anti degradation. So now let's talk about how water quality standards are used. Okay. And the, First one we talked about was monitoring, monitoring and assessment. And that's how you sample and analyze surface water quality. States have to assess whether their water quality, whether their waters comply with water quality standards, particularly the criterion, and that can be complicated. And why is that complicated? Well, water quality can vary based on the flow in a water body. It can be affected by seasonality, warm, cold, wet, and dry. Uh, you might have leaf fall uh, in the you know, stream or a river, you know, in the fall, and those can impact dissolved oxygen and color and all kinds of things, you know, that happen. So a state has to figure out how they're going to translate those water quality criteria into the data that they capture in their monitoring and sample. You know, and they got to think about how many locations are they going to sample? You know? How many are you going to collect? Once a month, once a year, once per year? You know, if you have hundreds of sites, it's pretty hard to do it every day and maybe even hard to do it every month. And so the water quality criterion, you know, some of them are also written with a duration of four days. You know, how does that work? You're surely not going to be out sampling every four days. Of and that's where I say, you know, statistics with, you know, the devil is in the details on that. And fortunately, some states will publish those details as to how they translate the data they collect from a network into how they comply with the state's water quality standards. Just to give you an example, Kansas has always been kind of recognized as having a very good uh, sampling program water quality across the state has been in operation for over 50 years, 160 permanent sites, which are the blue dots, 
and 167 what are called rotational sites, which are yellow dots. And even with those permanent sites, they're sampled quarterly. Okay, so four times a year is what those are getting sampled. And you look at some of these, you have a station here that it's going to be determining what the state believes the water quality is for all of those upstream waters. A lot of times you'll get more dense, particularly where you have some larger cities and dischargers. But it's just to show you that in a big state, you know, it's going to be hard to get to every water body and do it. So you have to make some calls, you have to use statistics, you have to use some water bodies that are similar to one another when you make these calls on, you know, the quality of the water. And then that monitoring and assessment piece, a lot of times feeds right into the TMDLs or the total maximum daily loads. And, you know, the total maximum daily loads come under Section 303D of the Clean Water Act. And it says that states are required to develop lists of impaired water. Impaired waters are basically, they don't meet those water quality criterion that we just talked about. And you know that basically because of that monitoring and assessment work we do. So it says on a priority base, states you know, are required to develop those PMBLs to try to bring a water back into compliance with the water quality criteria. And so TMDLs identify waste load allocations called for the impairing pollutant, and those are for point sources. Think of those as wastewater treatment plants. And you might have multiple waste load allocations depending on your water body. Non-point sources are also given load allocations, they're called. Quite a bit more hard to assess, a lot of statistics have to go into that. And the TMDL also incorporates uh, what's called a margin of safety and all of this is modeling and non-point point and, and it can be uh, pretty coarse calculations sometimes so you throw in a margin of safety and theoretically then if you add all the waste load allocations up and all the load allocations and the margin of safety and they turn out to be less than the TMDL then your water body complies and can probably come off of that impaired water and one thing I should add, some states also, particularly in these waste load allocations, will set aside some for a reserve for future growth in case one of those dischargers needs some additional uh, waste load. Again, I like pictures. And all this picture tries to show is that you've got these point sources here that discharge into the water body. They're given waste load allocations. You've got runoff. You know, as long as if it's urban runoff, it's not controlled by what's called an MS4 permit, the stormwater permit. You know, it's going to have some kind of an allocation associated with it. And then you get your margin of safety and again, all those things add up to the TMDL. This, I thought, you know, because I said that you could have multiple waste load allocations in a water body. This is a table out of the Kansas TMDL for total phosphorus for uh, the lower Kansas water body. And just to show you that there's all of these dischargers here that have a waste load allocation associated with them. So you've got a lot of players in some of these basins that you're going to be dealing with on these waste load allocations. And so what happens, you know, what's a TMDL set if a discharger expands, okay? Well, I know operators are probably familiar with what's called this Davidson tie that, you know, says, well, if I want to do pounds per day, I multiply million gallons per day of flow times milligrams per liter times 8.34. It's done like that. If you're looking at it the other way, the pounds per day, which is what the TMDL is often written in, it says milligrams per liter, if you want milligrams per liter, it's pounds per day divided by milligrams per million gallons per day times 8.34. So as an example, let's say that we have a facility that's got 11 pound per day uh, TMDL okay, for a particular pollutant, it's 1.3 million gallons per day. You divide that out, you get, okay, that's a million, or one milligram per liter times the kind of 
permit. So if the permit E though needed to increase its flow by three times, let's say go up to 3.9, what concentration is required? Well, it's going to be the same 11 pounds because that PMBL has been set. So you've got that same 11 pounds divided by 3.9 times 8.34, which is 0.33. And a lot of you good with math probably figured it out. Well, if they up the flow by three times, the concentration has to be divided by so that can get pretty tricky with some pollutants. You can really begin to get to the limit of technology as to what can be done on some of those particular parameters. So lastly, we're going to talk about how our water quality standards are used and what operators, cities, and industries typically see as those are what are used to derive permit limits. And typically the most stringent of the permit I'm going to give this really short refresher for those who aren't as familiar with the permitting. It's for the same pollutant, we have to select the most stringent of technology based effluent limits, PMDL based limits, or water quality based limits. And for POTWs or publicly owned treatment works, think of municipal dischargers that you know they have BOD, PSS, and PH. 30 milligrams per liter BOD, 30 milligrams per liter solid, 6 to 9 pH. Industrial users have these up guidelines. So you go figure that out for those dischargers. You kind of got them because they're technology based. Then you got to look and see if they've got TMDL based effluent limits. TMDL written in the water body where they discharge, and are they given a waste load allocation? So if they're in an impaired water, they probably do. So that comes into play. Hurry it and to these numbers. And then lastly, you have the water quality based effluent limitations, which are based on state water quality criteria. And those very often override those technology based limits because they, they tend to be more stringent. And a common one you see is BOD. We always think of BOD as 30 milligrams per liter. And I maybe shouldn't have put one quite this complicated in. Don't know, you know, BOD, you're looking at that's biochemical oxygen demand. So it means as you drop it in the water, it's going to demand oxygen. And there's a, a formula called the Streeter, Streeter Phelps uh, formula, a lot of people use to compute dissolved oxygen. So basically, it says you drop it in the water, and the bugs in the water are going to keep using that food. That organic matter that's in the BOD until it reaches a point to where the called reaeration in the water starts building the dissolved oxygen back up. And so what happens is if your water quality criterion would happen to be here and you first model it at 30 milligrams per liter of BOD and it bottoms out below that water quality water quality criterion then you've got to reduce the BOD up here at the wastewater plant. And so you'll often see BOD limits set anywhere from 5 to 15 milligrams per liter, even though everybody typically sees the technology-based limit of 30 milligrams per liter. And then if you want to look at how you compute, you know, on a concentration basis for other pollutants, it's a lot simpler than my picture looks, I think. You know, you probably know the upstream flow. Hopefully there's a U.S. Geological Survey gauge. Uh, hopefully your monitoring uh, network in your states captured the upstream concentration. You know the flow at your wastewater treatment plant. You're trying to figure the concentration that's allowed. You've got the flow in the river, which is just upstream plus what's being discharged. And then you have the concentration in the river, which is normally set at the water quality criterion. You just solve that equation to get what that concentration can be instead of solvent. Well, you'll see here, I also, though, have this little area put up here called the mixing zone. Many states will have mixing zones, and it will say, you know, you can only mix in 25% of the river, and maybe it has to be fully mixed within a quarter mile various things that different states have. And so that can trigger in to how that computation is made. There's a lot of other things that have to go into it. 
And one of them is, well, what upstream flow do I use? You know, I go out and I look at the Kansas River here near my house and, you know, it's up, you know, to top of the banks to times I see sandbars. So which one do I use when I compute a permit lemon? And so it's usually a what's called a critical low flow. And the typical uh, low flows you see are seven Q10 or the lowest seven day flow in a 10 year period. And that's hydrologically based. One that's generally preferred is what's called the 4B3 or the four day biological low flow. And that's a four day average event that occurs once every three years. And that really tries to estimate the, the acute biological exposure to water decline. You might have a mixing zone involved, like I've talked about before, that can limit the amount of flow that's used in, in calculating that limit. Um, mixing zones are used for chronic criteria. And often then you'll use a portion of the uh, mixing zone, which is called the zone of initial dilution. I see a lot of states use 10% of that mixing zone. And that's where acute criteria apply. Remember those that are early. So anyway, there's lots of things that go into the computation of those uh, water quality based effluent limits, along with just knowing what the water quality uh, criterion is. And then to, to maybe even shave those off some more, remember we've taken the lowest flow and and we've done some other things to try to minimize the impact, maybe mixing zones. EPA has what's called the technical support document, which says that, you know, well, effluent from a discharger can be, you know, pretty variable. If it's not very variable, you get a bell curve type of thing that looks, you know, most of the data concentrated right here around the one. But it says that, well, typically, if you don't know any better, you should use a coefficient of variation of 0.6. And so what that says, at 0.6, that curve looks more something like this. So I'm actually going to move that limit back from 1 to looks like 0 0.65, 0 0.7, you know, in order to make sure that because of the variability in the flow and I don't trigger that a violation any more often than I, I want to. So again, some, you know, things to be fairly conservative in, in doing that. This technical support document also covers bowl effluent toxicity, which is another criterion you'll find, you know, and that's where you actually expose life organisms to effluent and see what happens to them. Acute toxicity, again, is it kills the test organisms. And chronic toxicity is where you have those reproductive effects. And so it's usually done on two or three organisms. You'll do daphnia quite often to look at uh, invertebrate species be representative of those, and fathead minnows to be vertebrates. Recommend you also do something like algae. Uh, I don't see too many states that do that. And that is they're controlled in a lab. You take a sample and you expose those organisms and you look and see what they do in terms of survival and reproduction and you compare those then to different levels of exposure to effluent. And depending then uh, on what you find, you can have the acute toxicity, which is lethality or death, and you try to compute what the lethal concentration is for 50% die. That can become a permit limit. And for chronic toxicity, you look at that growth and reproduction, and that you try to compute what this intermission concentration for 25% of the organisms is. And that can be rolled then into a permit limit. Often you'll just see it as a, you know, the, these organisms have to survive or reproduce an X percent of effluent that's been diluted with uh, the remainder, you know, just clean lab water. So you'll find that. And so what I wanted to give you then on permit limits particularly is that water quality based limits are very based on conservative assumptions. That little flow, you know, a 10% chance it'll happen in any one year. You may want to look at seasonal low flows. You can compute low flows as being different winter and summer or wet and dry season, whatever those happen to be. 
they're based on the most sensitive species. And as I talked about before, you might want to say those sensitive species don't exist, you know, in my water body. So I'd like them pre computed uh, and get a criterion. You've got mixing zones thrown in that reduce, you know, the amount of water that's used to dare say dilute. And then you've got that tech support document, you know, that can modify and reduce those concentrations for toxics due to the variability of F1. And then there's a whole lot of assumptions that go into criterion also. Ammonia is based on pH and temperature. Um, heavy metals are based on hardness often. You've got copper, this biotic ligand model that's out there that has this whole string of parameters. You know, and do you have really good data on that? And the whole ethylene toxicity can really be based on temperature. So why do I say this is important to you to know about our quality standards? Well, it's just so you can better understand how your MPDS permit limits were developed. Again, understand there's lots of conservative assumptions and you just want to make sure all those assumptions are reasonable. And if they're not, you need a comment during public notice period. You know, hopefully every state's doing a fact sheet or what's called a statement of basis that explains the steps they went through and all the assumptions they made for doing that. Ask for that sometime if you're a permittee and, and, and try to see if you agree with how they came up with those limits. I say that because once a restrictive limit is established, there's a provision of the rules called anti-backsliding, which make it a future challenge of a standard difficult makes it very hard to increase that value once it's down at lower uh, value. It, again, will help you better understand what a variance might be appropriate uh, if you really just can't meet uh, the criterion. And that is possible. It's not an easy task. As I say, that can be a whole session in itself. Talk about variances, and it helps you better understand how TMDL, TMDL is developed, particularly if you have a waste load allocation associated with your facility, because there are lots of assumptions, lots of things that go into that. I said I'd give you some real world examples. Well, that one I gave you on the TMDL with the facility is one um, here in Kansas that uh, recently had a uh, industry being built that is a $4 billion with a B plan and uh, with 4,000 people associated with that construction and operation of that plant. And so they had a TMDL that really locked them in low. They had a very low flow. Now they get this big industry that uh, has a lot more flow that they have to treat, but they're locked in on that TMDL mass. So they have to meet a very stringent permit limit. You know, had they known this was going on up front when the TMDL was established, they maybe would have wanted to comment on that. So, um, hopefully, I've given you a very compressed, uh, very quick uh, review of what standards are. If you want to know more, there's a lot of resources out there. You've got EPA's Water Quality Standards Academy, again. It's in person in a five day course. I don't think they're offering that very often these days, but it is out there. Uh, they have taken a lot of those and turned them into online modules. So you can take your own self paced Water Quality Standards Academy if you would. And there's a link to that. Uh, EPA's main webpage has a good explanation of what water quality standards are. And, um, and links into specific topics. And then they've also got a uh, regulations and resource uh, with online links and topics at that link. And it's one of the things that you, you know, I think you find fascinating. It's like I mentioned, anti-degradation. Probably doesn't even take up one page in the regulation book. But I think the last time I looked, there were close to 800 pages of guidance, explanatory information out there. Why it may not look like much of a rule in books, there's been a lot of history behind it, a lot of regulations. So with that, uh, I've unintentionally run out the time, but I'm uh, welcome 
uh, Kristen, if we can, I will stay as long as anybody wants and try to answer questions. Yeah, so go ahead and get those questions in if you have any. Um, we have only received one so far, Mike. It was at the beginning of the webinar. Um, someone asks, how can a narrative criteria be turned into a numeric criteria? <laughs> That's a really great question. Uh, it's, uh, you know, you can take it, uh, uh, I don't think I can. Here we go. You know, you you could do um, tests on your own, say oil and grease. People have put different levels of oil and grease in water and see where they believe there's a sheen. Uh, quite often it was uh, used for that. Uh, you know, color. There are actually color scales out there you can use for water. Um, it, it, I find it kind of interesting because there's a lot these days on ways you come up with narratives for nutrients and then convert your narrative to a, a number. And you know, if you can do that, then you've probably done most all the work that's involved in uh, either an aquatic life analysis or some type of recreational analysis that would establish the number anyway. So, yeah, I think it's always kind of hard when people tell you, oh, just convert your narrative to a numeric. It's, uh, to me, you're basically just doing the work uh, that would be done to create a numeric. Awesome. Thank That's you, Mike. That's a great question, by the way, uh, because that happens quite often. We haven't received any other questions. Um, so thanks again, Mike, for sharing your expertise with us today. We appreciate you being here. Following this webinar, each of you will receive a follow-up email with the slides from today, as well as a link to the recording. Um, we ask that you complete the webinar evaluation that is following this webinar. There, so you can let us know your thoughts on today's session. Um, this will help us plan future webinars on topics that are important to you. Thanks again, everyone. We hope to see you at future EFCN events.